I'm so glad to see you today. And uh, I missed last Sunday not having you here at church and not being at church myself. And then Wednesday we missed a tremendous teaching, which we'll pick up for the first time we get back to a Wednesday night service. Uh, but I thank you. I thank you for your giving. I'm looking forward to the meal after. Everyone is invited, of course, to the meal after, and I'm sure there'll be uh, food to take home. But uh, at any rate, uh, I love you. I love you. And I pray that God is blessing you as richly as you are blessing me. And I mean that with all my heart. Amen. Now, I have to announce to you, you know, Sharon and I are going to be gone on the weekend of the 20th of January to do our son's wedding in uh, Chicago. And we have uh, a very great treat for you on that day. Uh, Brandon and Juliana are going to handle the service and preach for us on that Sunday. And we're excited about that. Amen. So now, if you will, let's stand and go to the Word of God. Now, I have a Christmas message for you this morning that I will share with you. And uh, next week will be a follow-up message to this Christmas message. And then, of course, Christmas, I believe. Uh, let's see, we go uh, the 23rd, we have church. And the 24th, we have a birthday. That would be mine. And then the 25th, we have another birthday, and that would be Christ. So his birthday is on Tuesday, correct? Yeah. And uh, and mine is just coming up on that Monday. You know? <laughs> and uh, But anyway, uh, so next week, I'm going to preach on the idea of joining forces with God. And we're going to make it a Christmas message, and we're going to share with you on that concept today. We're going to share with you the concept of the point of re-entry. Now when you read the scripture, you're going to say, Preacher, what does that have to do with Christmas? <laughs> Let's find out. The text comes from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Here's what the Word of God said. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, shall, uh, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye surely, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for the music. I thank you for the giving. I thank you for those that have come today to hear your word. Now, God, I ask you today to open our eyes that we could see and our ears that we could hear and our heart that we can understand what the Spirit of God is saying to us. I ask you, God, to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to our people and the word of God to come forth and fresh to our people so that we can see and know and understand the will of God, the direction of God, and the plan of God. And then as the word, will, and plan, and direction of God becomes apparent to us, I pray in Jesus' name that our people would apply the word of God to their lives, that it would change and transform them, form them, and renew their minds from whatever area of darkness the enemy would attack them in, into the glorious light of the kingdom of your dear Son. Father, we thank you for that and praise you for that. Holy Spirit, speak to us today. I submit myself and you myself to that end. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And you may be seated. 
I'm going to speak to you today on a Christmas topic called the point of reentry. The point of reentry. Now, the text that I gave you this morning is the point where man separated himself from God. But in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 15, something happened that I want you to see. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it will bruise your head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, the genesis of the birth of Christ, of the Christmas story, was laid out by God. He exposed his mind as he began to talk about the seed of the woman and what that seed would do. He said, I put in enmity, opposition, between you, woman, that communicated with the enemy and between the enemy that caused you to fall. For what purpose was it necessary to introduce the seed into the earth? Well, there's my message. The seed that God prophesied in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 would be the point that God would use to re-enter into His own creation. The seed that God promised would be the point of re-entry that God would use to enter into His own creation. It was necessary for Jesus to come into the earth because man had believed a lie and still is. Men are still believing a lie that they can live without God, that there is no God, that there is no heaven, and that there is no hell, that man can say they believe in God and live in direct disobedience, direct rebellion, direct in opposition, in enmity towards God by the way they live, and that God, because He is a God of love, is going to look past their rebellion, their irreverence, their disobedience, and say, I've loved you too much to judge you to a devil's hell. That's a lie that we're believing in this age. We're saying that if you say that you believe in the name of Jesus Christ, you can live any way you choose. And because you've made that comment, everything's going to be okay. God's going to look over your indiscretions. God's going to look over your rebellion. God's going to look over your disobedience. And say to you in the end resolved, come on in. Because I love you that much. Well, I have a question for you today. If that is God's disposition then why did He not do that with Adam and Eve? How come He didn't do it with Adam and Eve? The Bible said, if we leave them here, they're going to be as we are, therefore we must put them outside the garden. And so He did and gave them the description of how their life would be. Now God in His grace, however, made a method whereby man could come back to God through the seed of a woman that would crush the devil's head. But God is not a God that deals with disobedience, irreverence, disrespect, making God irrelevant. Or I might add to you that that is how the serpent became the serpent to begin with, he made God irrelevant. He said, I will be God myself. That's what we're teaching men to do today. Live like you want to. Walk like you want to. Talk like you want to. Think like you want to. Walk in the passions and lust of the age. You be a God unto yourself. 
But if you say you know Jesus, God will look beyond that. And I ask the question again, why did he not do that with Adam and Eve? It was necessary for Jesus to come into the earth because man had believed a lie. And in believing was deceived by what I will call the greatest sermon and the sermon of the age, the sermon of Satan which led man to a state of separation from the Creator God. Because of rebellion, because of disobedience, now watch this, watch this now, because of intellectualizing the words, because of practic making practical the words, and taking a spiritual thing and making it a physical thing, Rebellion, disrespect, disobedience, and irreverence became the order of the day, and man was put out of the place God had prepared for them. They believed the lie. The sermon was a good one. It sounded good. It was very satisfactory to the ear. I look at the things we preach and teach today. I look at the prosperity gospel. Someone said, don't you believe in that? Oh yeah. God is a God that prospers the man whose soul and mind is stayed on him. I believe in prosperity. But I do not subscribe to the fact of the way the prosperity people teach prosperity. Because prosperity becomes the God and not the God being the God of prosperity. We believe a lie. We teach a lie. We make it so satisfactory to people's ears that people will feel very secure in themselves and we even refer to it in those terms. But I would remind you that Adam and Eve did not have eternal security. Because when disobedience came, God put them out of the place where He had provided for them. God made a sacrifice for them and clothed them, but put them out under the curse into the world. And lo and behold... The next thing you hear is their children have turned on each other and one is dead and one is alive and one is cursed and one's blood calls from the ground. And God recognized that blood because that blood was representative of another blood that would fall upon Calvary's hill from the prophecy of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Glory to God. <laughs> Satan was more subtle, subtle than anyone. The only one that knew what was in Satan was God himself. He was the one that had cast him out of heaven for his evil desires. He was the one that saw in him who he really was. Now church, I have to stop right there and say this about you and me. God knows the hair on your head. He knows when you lose a hair on your head. God knows you extremely well. And we may feel like we hide from God and we keep away from God and we can find a place where God can't get to. But the truth of the matter is, my friend, nothing we do in disrespect, in disobedience is being hidden from God. How do you know that, preacher? Because the day they fell, God showed up in the garden and He began to call. And He said, Adam, where art thou? What have you done? He knew what they had done. He was aware of what they had done. He knew exactly what they had done. And then He made them confess to Him what they had done. God was not displaced off somewhere wandering while Adam and Eve, but God came back to 
just like he always did and looked for them in the cool of the day. And, he, and they said, uh, they said, he said, what are you wearing? And, and, and they said, we saw and realized we were naked. God is not hidden from who you are, nor from what you're doing, nor from what you're thinking, nor from where your rebellion is. God is not hidden from that church. His deception of Adam and Eve began with the question of the intentions of God and the goodness of God in the provision of God. Yea, hath God said he should not eat of every tree of the garden? This deceptive concept continues in our doctrine today. His desires were to marginalize or to treat as insignificant the words of God and to cause Eve to consider the possibility that God didn't mean what He said. Can you see that in our church world today? Can you see in our church world today that we look at the Word of God and say, did God really mean that there's coming a judgment day? Did God really mean that there's coming a place called hell? That God is going to store and place people that have not known Jesus Christ in the free part? Did God really mean that? Surely not. Because the Bible calls Him a God of love. But the truth of the matter is, my friend, rebellion, disobedience, irreverence, and anything that is not in line with the Holy God stands in enmity with God just like the serpent did. Opposition to God. She said, we may eat of the tree of the garden, trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst. God said you shouldn't eat that. You're not going to eat that because when you touch it, you'll die. Satan, now watch this, began to discuss a possibility that he could not physically understand. As in her natural eye, the tree looked good. And it appeared to be good for food. And it would enhance their intellectual abilities. Because it would make them wise. But Satan, now watch this now. Read that in red. She looked at it from the physical side. She said, look at here. In my natural eye, it looks good. In my natural eye, it will taste good. In my natural eye, it will make me smarter about how to do the things. I'll be intellectually proven. But look at the red. Satan knew the spiritual effects of disobedience. How come we can't come to that conclusion? How come we can't come to the conclusion that disobedience will take a physical, a spiritual toll that may manifest itself in the physical, but it will take a spiritual toll on you and it will begin to diminish and result if not checked, asked forgiveness of, and stepped over and gone on? will create a separation for, from God exactly as it did for Adam and Eve. Someone said, Preacher, this doesn't sound like a Christmas message to me. It's at this point when she decided to accept another word, when she decided to take, take things from another angle, through another mouth, I've said to you about a billion times, don't run to people looking for advice. Don't run to people trying to find out what they think about your situation. Do what the Bible says do. Live like the Bible says live. How do we know that? Because Eve and Adam with her took another word on the direct instruction of God and it got them booted out of the garden and the curse fell upon every from that day and continues to today upon every man that knows not the blood of Jesus Christ. What a sermon. What a sermon. We preach the gospel of peace, joy, and deliverance and it appears that the sermon of sin is a 
disobedience, rebellion, and irreverence has overtaken a world that God created to be in His own servant. It was powerful, church. Satan had preached the sermon of a lifetime. Eve accepted it. Both of them heard it. Both of them accepted it. Allow me to stop here and say these words. The method of Satan's plans is, was, and always will be the same. His sermon will always steal from you. It will always kill you. And it will always destroy you. And it will always destroy the work of the Word of God. It will water the work of the Word of God down until you can become satisfied with your little corner of the market and say, okay then, I think now I'm okay with God. I think God deals with me in such a way, I'm okay with God. And I must be okay with God because this works for me and, and that works for me. And so I must be okay with God. When all the while, the devil is sitting back with his measure to steal, kill, and destroy the work of God that is in you that requires you to live a life of holiness before the Lord and a life in full view of what Jesus did for you at Calvary. If your life does not reflect the accomplishments of the cross, then you better evaluate what message you're listening to because there is a close step between you and out of the garden door. His plan was to deceive any person who would challenge him through having and expressing faith in God. Now I'm going to stop and ask you this question. Do any of you ever feel that challenge? Do any of you ever sense that Satan is challenging your faith? Well, that didn't start yesterday. That started in the book of Genesis. God watched while Satan began to challenge his word in his creation and his creation Seeing what they said, what the Word was saying in opposition to the Word of God, watched while man received it and took it. Now watch this now. Watch what I'm about to say. Took it into their themselves. They ate of it. They took it on the inside of them. It became a part of them. And the only remedy was provided in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. It is the only remedy. It will be the only remedy. Government projects will never serve to be the remedy. Money will never serve to be the remedy. Houses, homes, lands, and cars will never serve to be the remedy. There is but one remedy, and it is the seed of a woman that gave God the point to re-enter into man through the death of Calvary's tree and the blood that fell into the earth that cries out to God and says to God, any man that believes in this blood has a re-entry of the God of the creation back into him and the re-entry of the garden of Eden to live on the inside of that land. Now watch this because I want you to see. That sermon is one that would supply, surely, surely you can be disobedient. Don't have to worry about it. Surely if you look at the love of God, what He's done for you, you don't have to worry about your disobedience. What a sermon He preached, but what a lie. Now it's clear that the sermon of Satan was a lie, but when they accepted it, it became real to them. And it served to place man in the grip and under control of Satan. Man would now be spiritually dead for eternity. Do you remember this morning I said that the promise of eternity is as sure as any other promise in the Word of God? Remember that? 
And remember I said the promise of giving it shall be given to you. If you give and don't rob God, He'll open the windows of heaven. Is as sure as the promise of eternal life. Remember that? Well, let me tell you one more promise that is equally as sure. It is equally as sure that for God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But he that believeth not is condemned already. That is an equally sure promise for every man, woman, boy, and girl who lives in the satisfaction that rebellion, irreverence, and disobedience causes. Equally sure. But now there was going to be two seeds. The seed present in the garden on the day was a seed full of sin, disobedience, and rebellion. But there was to come a seed in the future. That seed of the Father God would be introduced into the world through prophecy for years until it springs forth as the baby born in Bethlehem and he would become the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he would become the point of reentry for God into man. What a great thing. So why the birth of Jesus to become the means whereby God would have the legal right to have a point of reentry into the lives of men. A sin and a spot of seed had to be introduced into the world to become the sacrifice for believing the sermon of the deception of sin that led man into spiritual devastation. The seed needed to be planted, now watch this, and grow so that the world could experience the fruit of that seed. But most importantly, the one that preached the original message of deception, watch this, would forever be destroyed in his work by the seed. Remember what God said to Adam, he will bruise his head. Crush his head. The birth of Christ was the point whereby God reentered the world. The point of reentry. These would never, now watch this because it's something you need to behold. Someone has said, where, well, where is the Garden of Eden today? Someone said, well, we think it's in, it was in Iraq. But we know that the tree of life is by the river. In heaven. And there are probably many of them. Because they are there for the healing of the nations. But there is still a tree of life. That exists for mankind. Proverbs 13, 12 said. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. Waiting on it. Makes for longing. And looking. And hoping. But when the desire cometh. But when he comes. It's a tree of life. Jesus is the tree of life. I'm going to prove it to you. His life would become the point of reentry and, and be planted in man and grow in us and we would become the building, temple, and habitation of God. First Corinthians 3, 9 said, For we are laborers together with, with God. You are God's husbandry and you are God's building. Amplified says it this way. For we are fellow workmen, joint promoters, laborers together with and for God. Ye are God's garden and vineyard and field under cultivation. You are God's building. He is building the tree of the garden of Eden and Christ is in you according to Colossians 1.27 as the hope of glory. Christ in you. The everlasting tree of life living and abiding in the believer and that believer can overcome the destroying works of the devil because there's a tree growing on the inside of you and he you have become his garden and his figure and you're a co-labor with God. What a wonderful thing to know. Through Christ, the tree of life is planted in you, according to Colossians 1.27. The point of reentry, the spirit of life, which is Christ in you. The ultimate plan of God was for him to sow himself into you so that you can become the very image of God because of Christ Jesus. 
This same stone would grow in you. And according to John 17, 21, it would grow in you so that you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost could all be one. There's a re-entry that God made into man. And that re-entry has made you attend the very image of God. According to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, the tree of life is growing in you. And it continues to grow as long as you allow God to cultivate it. Because He is building the temple of God in you in this Christmas season. <laughs> then you can experience the life that Adam had in the garden. Someone said, how, how come we never got to the garden? We did. We did. It's called Jesus Christ in you. The point of re-entry. We got to the garden. We walk in the garden by faith because we have experienced the seed of Abraham. Now watch this. Watch these scriptures. John 14, 6 calls him the seed of life. John 8, 12 calls him the seed that grows because he is the light. He grows everything by his own light. Every seed that is planted in you with the light of the life of Jesus Christ shines on the inside of you. How does it shine in me, preacher? The Word of God said in Romans 10, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Life comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Life comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And the life in you is the tree of life that is the life of Christ Jesus, where the Word of God said in John Romans chapter 8, the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus is in you, and it is a hope of an eternal glory with God forever. Amen. Now look at this, John 6.35. All seeds need a food source. And Jesus said unto them, I am is the bread of life. All of us need a food source. He that cometh to me, he will never hunger. Can you understand that when a tree grows to be however big it grows, it is growing deeper under the ground and wider under the ground than it is growing to the natural eye. It is reaching out to a source under the ground to nourish itself. He that cometh to me is going to have a root in himself, a tree of life that reaches out to wherever the source that it needs to sustain itself is located. God. <laughs> John 11, 25. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. What did Adam, Eve, the serpent, tell Eve? Said, you'll surely not die. God said, you surely will die. Then along came the tree of life. And the tree of life, Jesus said, unto her I am the resurrection and the life. I will take the dead and bring them back to life again. I will take those that have been lost and cut up by the curse and bring them back to life. I am the point of re-entry that has brought, been brought to you through the power of God. He that believeth in me, though, watch it now, though he were dead. Dead how? Was he dead physically? Or was he dead spiritually? Well, the Word of God declares that the death in the Spirit is worse than death in the flesh. Bless God. Because spiritual death is as eternal, as eternal, as eternal as eternity can be. Separation from God will never end. But then the resurrection of the dead. You were born inside by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of man that was the, has the surety of life on the inside. Because He lives, we live also. See, when we sing that song, Because He Lives, we have a reason to sing that song. 
Because through it, we live. We don't live in the physical. We're living in the spiritual. You cannot take physical things, intellectualize them. You cannot take physical things <coughs> and rationalize them so that they can be understood in the spirit. It will not work. The only thing that touches spirit is spirit. And the thing that is spirit and life in us, according to Jesus himself, he said, my words are spirit and my words are life. He is the tree of life on the inside of you. And because that tree lives in us, we live also. He was the point of a baby in a manger in Bethlehem. He was the point of a baby that they worship. That God sent back into the earth with the express idea that he would die at Calvary's tree when he got to be 33 years old and shed his blood so that you and I could have him living as a tree of eternal. He's good to eat. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He's great to look at. He's the high priest of our confession. He is the wisdom of all ages. He is the God of the beginning and end, the first and last. He that was and is to come. He is the wonderful king and the wonderful counselor. He was born a baby, but glory to come. He sits on the right hand of God today and ever live to make an exception for the children of God. He's a tree of life. Oh, yes, he is. Ain't done. Going to be a few more, just a couple more minutes. Philippians 2.13, watch this. It says he works upon your spirit to build a house that reflects the image of Christ. For it is God which worketh in you both to do his will and to do his good pleasure. 2 Timothy 1.1 1, 1 said, The life in you was his point of entry for you that is producing the image of God. Acts 3.15, watch this. And they killed the prince of life, the author and finisher, the captain, the dominion of life and the source of life. But here's the great thing about that baby who grew to be a man, who gave God a point to get back into the life of man. We have seen him, and we have heard him, and we experience him, and our lives are changed because of him. Zechariah called him the branch. The tree, the branch, look at it. He said, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 8. Behold, the man whose name will be the branch, the tree on the inside of you. Zechariah 6, 12. He is the vine from John 15. He is the tree of life in you, the call called the building of God in the temple that God has made you for his house to function and live in as long as you will live before him in obedience. And he's destroyed the work of the devil. 2 Peter 1, 3, 4. Going to be done in just a second. According to his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The tree of life has given you everything you're looking for. The world wants to tell you that there are other means and other ways for you to get to happiness. There are other ways. There are other styles. Some people would tell us that there are more ways to get to God. You can find God. You, you don't have to go through Christ. You can find God in so many areas. They've tried to find Him in the tree. He's fed. They've tried to find Him in animals. He's there. They tried to find him in money. He's there. But those things are the results, not the genesis. You see that? They're the results, not the genesis. So wherever you're seeking out something that you think makes you happy, Wherever you're seeking out something that you think is the end-all, be-all that's going to give you everything that this life. Understand one thing. 
It will never be the result. The result of happiness only comes from the tree of life that was planted in the Garden of Eden, that is planted in heaven today, that is given to you for your healing, for your joy, for your peace, for your soundness, for your preservation, for the salvation of God. The only peace and happiness that you will ever find was born in a manger in Bethlehem. Glory to God. Walked among men and showed us the Father and said, if you believe in me, you, me, and the Father will be one and I will be in you a tree of life springing up out of you unto an eternal life so that you can abide in me and I will abide in you now and forever. Glory be to God. He's the point of reentry. He gave us Jesus, the seed of life. The knowledge through the knowledge of Him. Listen, if you know Him, there's life in Him. And hath called us unto glory. Church, He did not call you to be a pauper. Someone said, yeah, but everybody ain't rich. That ain't what a pauper is. A pauper is the one who's left in the curse. The rich man is the one who finds the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Why would he be rich? Because it is that man and only that man that Paul said, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Amen. Uh, you ain't, you can't be a pauper if you ain't in the curse. If you are in the curse, you are a pauper, lost to your own devices, rebellions, and irreverence and disobedience. You may make something out of life in this world, but in the next world to come, your life will turn into a watch my language living hell because that's where the curse is. Thank God. He's given me all things. And the glory. And the excellence of God. Whereby given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. I started off this morning with that comment. Exceeding great and precious promises. The promise of Christ to seed in you. Was the hope of glory. You're rich. That baby made you rich. That baby made you rich. Because that baby made the God of the universe your Papa Daddy. I want you to see that today. That baby made the God of the universe your Papa Daddy. He gave you the ability to say, Abba, Father. That's my dear Papa Daddy. And his son has lived in me as a tree of life and therefore I am a child, I am a son, I am a joint heir, and I am a priest of a royal nature. I'm rich. Glory to God. I'm rich. I'm rich. I'm rich. I'm saved. I'm sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm rich today because He is my dear Papa Daddy. And it all happened because God saw a way through the fall, through the seed of a woman, to re enter to a baby born in Bethlehem who grew to be the king. To be the prophet. To be the priest. But greater than all of that. He grew him to be the sacrifice. So that by his blood. Frank. You could know him. Tommy. He could change your life. Susan. He could heal your body. He can bring you out of things you never dreamed. 
Leon, you can know him. You can know him just like you know Tom and Susan. And you can walk with him and talk with him. Amen. The point of reentry. Ted, he can take you over the hard spots in life. Tara, he can heal your body and minister in your family. Over everything that comes your way, he is in you. A tree that is good. A tree that if you will eat him, it will heal your life and those around you. And he will give you wisdom that is beyond anything you could ever imagine. That's what the tree of life does for you. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Now, Father, you have given us a point of reentry. Today in this building, God, there are those that are under the sound of this message that have things that beguile them, thoughts that beguile them. The enemy attacks them, but your word said, that when the seed came, he came to destroy the works of the devil. Paul said that we would not be tempted above that we are able to bear. How do we bear temptation? Because there is a tree of life living in us. And that tree of life is giving us the nourishment so that our bodies can cast forth fruit that are acceptable before you. And you, if we will allow you, according to John 15, will prune away from us the things that the enemy, through his devices and temptations, would bring at us, that you will give us the ability to remain nourished in the tree of life. Now God, I don't know who's hearing me today that is willing to say, God, prune me today. Prune me that my fruit, prune me that my prayer, prune me that my life may be sourced by the resource of the tree of life so that it may be good to my eyes so that it may be good to me for food, and so that I may need it and become wise to be able to overcome the enemy as he attacks me, attacks my family, does anything to me, God, that I can eat of this tree, Jesus Christ, and be totally nourished. Who's willing to say that today? I lay it down. I lay it down. I lay it aside because I see a tree. And I hear a voice. One voice tells me you can live however you want and God loves you. The other voice says, but my sheep know my voice. And they hear my voice. And they won't listen to another. Because they're nourished by me. Because my word to them is spirit and my word to them is life. I'm encouraging you today to choose life. Choose life. Choose life. He gave you a point of re-entry into your life and said that point of re-entry would not only die for you, but he would intercede for you and he would be your advocate. Today I'm asking you as the high priest intercedes for you to allow him to be your advocate and stand to your feet and say, God, I surrender everything to that man Jesus Christ. I surrender who I am to the tree of life. Make it good to me for vision. Make it good to me for food. Make it good to me for wisdom. As I live a life that reflects the tree Jesus Christ living in me and longing no more. It is mine. What I have desired has come. And I receive it 
In the name of Jesus, if you'll stand to your feet and raise your hands and say, I receive it in Jesus' name. I receive it in Jesus' name. It belongs to me. The tree of life, Christ is in me. And therefore, I am pruning by the hand of God all of the fruit <coughs> that is contrary to that tree. I want the fruit of love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, and faith. I want that fruit in me to grow. And then I want the fruit of prayer to become real to me. And it's there because Jesus died. The baby lived. The baby died. And the baby lives again. And Hebrews 1 and 3 said, He ever lives and sits at the right hand of the God of majesty. Today He belongs to you. The baby, the baby has grown now watch me now to become a seed in you. The Bible said he was a seed of a woman. The Bible said he was the seed of Abraham. The Bible said he was the seed of David. He was the seed of a woman to live to be the sacrifice for man. He was the seed of Abraham so that you could enter uh, in heaven Everything that God promised Abraham, all the blessings belong to you. And he is the seed of David so that you can inherit the kingdom of God living in you. The baby re-entered, died, rose again, and came back to be in you. The seed of God. Crushing the head of the devil. For who? For Paul. Rick, for Christine, for Tara, for Sheldon, for Jesse, and Joy, Lou Ann, and Chris Snow, and Ted, and Amy, and Christine, and Terry, and Martha, and Lorraine, and Charlie Elba, Wayne, Tony, and Stephanie. For Susan, he's crushing the devil's head by the sea on the inside. And for Leon, for Tommy, <laughs> For Emma, for Sharon, for Michelle, for Frank, for Rita, for Shana, for Travis, for the children, for Steve and Becky, for Dan, for Tony, for Travis, for Mike. The seed is in us. And that seed has crushed and destroyed every work that the devil holds over your head. What a mighty God. Huh? What a mighty God. 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 Peace, peace. Wonderful peace. Flowing down from the Father. Above, sweep over my spirit forever. I pray <coughs> in the light of his glory and grace. Say that with me, will you? Because that's what God gave you the seed in you. Peace, peace, wonderful peace, flowing down from the Father above, will sweep over my spirit forever, I pray in the light. Right here. Amen. That said, if I abide in him and he abides in me, 
I could ask the Father whatever I want. I'm one with the Father. The devil's work in me is destroyed. Amen. Father, I thank you for the people. I thank you for the Word of God. I thank you, God, for the baby that gave us a point of reentry. For the life that he lived. For the death that he endured. But for the life that came out of the tomb and was seated at the right hand of God. For the life that he gave to me that gives me the hope of his beauty, power, and purpose in me. As I live, the life of an overcomer because of the seed in me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Change, change, transform by the Word of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I thank you for coming this way today. I'm going to tell you something, the Word of God's the most dynamic thing. I've ever, I, I cannot tell you. It's dynamic. It's dynamic. You need to go to YouTube and listen to this sermon again. Mike Springston, FFC. If you have not signed up on YouTube under Mike Springston, FFC, you need to go subscribe because there are things in this that you need to hear over and over and over and over again because you will gravitate to what you repeat. You will understand what you repeat. Let me show you. When they first told you what 2 plus 2 was, how many of you knew it right off? Just easy. Now everybody had to gravitate to it by repeating. And they would show you this and that and say, here, if you take this one, can you count one, two, three, four? And they would say, now what's two plus two? And you would say six. <laughs> huh? I remember teaching a little special ed kid uh, his ABCs. You know his ABCs. You just don't know how long it took you to learn them. Because you've repeated them so many times, you don't know. I was teaching a little kid. I said, say, say your ABCs. He said, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, N, P, Q, O, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. Now I know my ABCs. Tell me what you think of me. I said, hey, you got it. He said, yes, but, but, but Mr. Springston, what exactly is an element of P? <laughs> and so you learned that by repeating. Listen, study the Word of God. Amen. Go to the YouTube site and listen to the ministry. It will bless you and it will grow you and the seed on the inside of you will begin to be a vine and to grow and your abiding in Him will cause you to be able to live in the life that God planned for you to live. Now let's bless food. And we're going next door. Now you can go out that door. Well, you can go out that door. You can go either way you want. But go in those other doors because I want you to get this food. These women can cook. Wonderful, wonderful women cooking here. Amen? All the men say, Amen. <laughs> Father, bless this food, bless this fellowship, and bless this church. Bless every hand that put a finger to making this food with a special blessing. God, I pray that as we fellowship today, the Spirit of God would hover and be with us. Thank you for this church and these people. I thank you for the food we're about to receive as you nourish it to the good of our bodies so that we may go to the service of you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Amen.